Welcome to WesleyGospel.com. I'm going to talk about the effect of deism on the church and how it's destroyed the supernatural aspect of Christianity in so many areas. Um, this applies to liberal churches just as much as it applies to fundamentalist Baptist and Presbyterian churches. Because the issue here is deism. Deism is accepting a belief in God in which there are no supernatural aspects whatsoever. No miraculous experiences, no supernatural aspects. It comes to be accepted. There is no crisis of faith over it. It's just simply accepted that your life will have no supernatural aspects about it whatsoever. And all of this is considered to be okay. And even though we have tons and tons of supernatural aspects in the Bible, this deism, um, or cessationism, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing, was this anti-supernatural, non-supernatural, desupernaturalized form of Christianity. And it's extremely damaging. Something in the vicinity of 75% of, of American Christians are in this deism and or cessationism category where there are no supernatural aspects whatsoever and it's all considered it's accepted it's swallowed it's normal this is this is considered to be normal and uh, no it's not that's that's not that's not what Christianity is supposed to look like it's not supposed to look like that. Um, and I don't care if your family is doing that. I don't care if people think that. You know, they and they and they point to the scientific community. Look, the scientific community does not acknowledge scripture as authoritative. Why do these people allow it to speak with so much authority to the point of altering and changing their theology to the point of denying what scripture says even that's unbelief i don't care what you call it you can go through the motions you can get yourself a nifty building and you can even pay your tithe but you know you want to die with that on your on your soul Think about it. Do you want to die with that on your soul? Do you want to die with that on your soul and, when, uh, and with the full knowledge that you're raising your children under that? A non-supernatural form of Christianity? What's the matter with you? Hmm? So the Bible doesn't, doesn't teach that at all. Uh, the Bible teaches Pentecostalism. That's what it teaches. You find Pentecostalism in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It teaches Pentecostalism. And yes, it's true that a lot of Pentecostalism has um, allowed the floodgates of bad doctrine to come in, and we need to get back to our doctrine. We need to get back to our Assemblies of God and Church of God type doctrine. But that doesn't mean that true Christianity, biblical Christianity, does not teach Pentecostalism. It still does. It still does teach Pentecostalism. So, um, with that being said, I just want to exhort people to don't settle, don't settle for something else that's not in the Bible. Some deistic, non-supernatural -form, non form of Christianity, when you know full well... That there's Pentecostals out there, you know. Um, so, go to Acts chapter 19, please, KJV. Acts chapter 19, KJV. I'm gonna, we're gonna take a look at the first five verses in Acts 19, one to five. All right. Acts 19. It says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? 
And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, these people understood repentance from sin, okay? And in that sense, they were lordship people, okay? I would liken these to the lordship salvation Calvinists today. People who believe in water baptism, people who believe in repentance. But they do not have the Pentecostal baptism in the Holy Spirit. They don't feel the Holy Spirit blanketing them when they worship. They don't raise their hands because they never feel the impulse of the Spirit to raise their hands. See, that's where the raising the hands thing comes from. It's not a thing that Pentecostals do as a custom, necessarily. It originally is coming from an impulse of the Holy Spirit. With their eyes shut, they feel the Holy Spirit tell them to raise their hand. And they do it out of obedience. Um, uh, they do it out of obedience to the to the Holy Ghost impulse. All right. um, so, here's the thing. Baptists and Presbyterians... And not just them, but liberals as well. Anybody who adopts a non-supernatural form of Christianity is in the Acts 19.2 category. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Man. I heard a Church of God preacher during college preach on that. And he said, he said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Man, I remember he when he preached that from that, he just he just looked up from his Bible and just had a just a, a look of just disgust on his face. How could you live like that? How could you live like that all your life? All your Christian life. Not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Man, that's bad. That is bad. Now, you can't get all the way up into Acts 19 without associating speaking in tongues with the reception of the Holy Ghost. In other words, on your body. Okay, so we're not talking about regeneration of the Holy Spirit as that burning sensation inside you. We're no, not not so much. We're we're talking about on top of you and being outwardly evidenced by speaking in tongues to the point where the subjective experience is feeling the presence of God, but the other people nearby you may or may not feel the presence of God, but they can see that you're clearly speaking in tongues. So that's why they said. Uh, so so these people uh, end up you know receiving the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and prophesying, and and that was the pattern in Acts ten and that was the pattern in in Acts chapter two. First you feel the Holy Spirit on you, and then you end up speaking in tongues and prophesying. So the tongues is a side effect of what we've come to call the baptism in the Holy Ghost in Pentecostalism. The baptism in the Holy Ghost. In other words, feeling the Holy Spirit during worship or prayer. You're feeling the Holy Ghost. That's called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And is it possible to be baptized in the Holy Ghost without speaking in tongues? Yeah. There's lots of people who claim that. There's Baptists who claim that. That you can feel the Holy Spirit during worship, during during songs, during preaching, you can feel the Holy Spirit on you without speaking in tongues. Right. But why stop there? Why not move on to tongues and interpretation? Why not move on to words of knowledge? Why stop there? Oh, my church doesn't let that. What does God want you to do? Ask yourself that question. What does God want? 
Does he want you to stop halfway or does he want you to go all the way? Right? I was watching this uh, video called The Occult in Your Living Room by Stephen Dollins. If you have the stomach for that sort of thing, I highly recommend you watch it. It's very long. It's like a six-hour series, and uh, or it's like a five-hour series. I, I put it on Wesley Gospel. Is a guy who used to be a Satanist, and then he became a believer, and he would lecture in churches on the occult and how dangerous it is and how real it is. Um, he was part of the Church of Satan group. And um, I, I just listened to the first half an hour or so. And what made him turn towards it was several aspects. But one of the, one of the critical elements that made him turn towards this was that he was just kind of like a church kid. And there was no supernatural aspect in his church. And, he, he, and so he did not... He did not have, he did not view, he did not witness any supernatural elements in his church upbringing. And then when his dad died, uh, he got mad at God, and he joined this Satan group that he had come to know through a research paper that he was doing in high school. He did a research paper on the occult in high school and ended up getting. Uh, making friends with some of these uh, uh, witches and stuff in the occult underground in his town, and one of one of the wizards was actually a biology teacher at his high school, and they were into drugs and the occult there. So anyway, just this story was just so, you know, just gut wrenching and just, just listening how and you know it's because one of the aspects. Is is just simply this, that Christians like John MacArthur, for all that they are valuable in teaching us lordship salvation and and to and to to teach against cheap grace, they allow for and even aggressively teach people to deny and to ignore the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit in their lives, and all of this is considered to be normal. All of this is accepted as, as if it were okay or even wise. And it is so anti-scriptural, and it allows for people like Stephen Dollins to look at our dead, deistic, cessationist, anti-supernatural church culture, de-supernaturalized church culture, and they lose their faith in hell. They lose their faith in the power of God. They lose their they don't even know it's there. They're like the guy in Acts 19 too. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And then they might hear about some occult group in their town. They get curious. I mean if they're that type of a person, some type of people the you know, the type of people that get into this stuff are usually heavy metal people or and people who are into horror movies. People like me. <laughs> People like me. And if it weren't for me experiencing the Holy Spirit when when I was in high school and becoming Pentecostal, who knows whether or not I would have got hooked up with a group like that. But, you know, the, the, the profile is heavy metal, drug dealer, drugs, heavy metal, drugs. Um, yeah, I mean, those two things um, in horror movies. If you have those three interests, you could easily get sucked in to one of these these groups, and um, and so another thing is just experience with dreams and visions already. If you have dreams and visions already, you could get sucked into these groups, and and he was in that category from a young childhood up. He had dreams and visions and stuff like that. So. <laughs> What's, what's so horrible about the seeker-sensitive movement is that it has come in to the Pentecostal churches and it has, it, it has taken its, its hands and it has throttled the theological necks of Assemblies of God Theological Seminary and Church of God Theological Seminary, the Pentecostal Seminary, and it has just choked and throttled the theological vitality of Pentecostalism. And it's it's just sad. 
And so God has tried to restore his power, his prophecy, his purpose, his baptisms in the spirit, his healings, his deliverances, his act casting out of devils, and it gets hidden away in a corner somewhere. You, the big Pentecostal churches are seeker-sensitive. They don't preach doctrine. They don't preach Pentecostal doctrine. They don't preach Pentecostal experience. They're seeker-sensitive. They're giving stage plays. There's no seriousness in their services. And uh, this is, it's like they're retreated. It's like they retreated from the Pentecostal power. They retreated. And there's, there's a kind of a deism in a lot of these Pentecostal churches. It's kind of come in. And uh, I'm not saying it's like that across the board, but that's been my experience the past 20 years. You know, unless you're talking like some of the black Pentecostal churches where the seeker-sensitive movement didn't really affect. Uh, I don't think the seeker-sensitive movement really affected, that really all that much affected the black Pentecostal churches. It seems to be a white phenomenon. Um, but, uh, guys, if, if we don't move in the power of the Holy Ghost, if we don't move in the gifts, in the, the dream, in the baptism, and in the healing, and in the exorcisms of the Holy Ghost, people are going to get pulled into the occult more and more. But more than that, deism will continue to rob the faith. Scientism will continue to rob the faith of the Christian church. There's erosion going on. And it's this environment of erosion of deistic and and, and scientific over over emphasis on trusting in what the scientific community says about things that are hard to believe, like the origins of man or genetic predispositions towards homosexuality or any other number of things. All I have to say is that things that are hard to believe, where people have this implicit trust in the scientific community, and they do not have an implicit trust in the God of the Bible, and there's a complete environment of desupernaturalized theology, where people are not praying, they're not having prayer meetings to have experiences of God, okay? It's this type of an environment that allows for groups like Church of Satan in biker gangs to to take people that are prone towards the supernatural to suck them right into some witch group they 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 thrive on that they say to themselves we have we have spiritual power what do you guys have nothing so the satanists can look at the church and they can agree with acts 192 they can say we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. That's why they worship the devil. Right? He's more real to them. See? And so we've gotta we've gotta come back with Pentecostal power and with the miraculous gifts and make this a really strong emphasis. And of course, we also have to make Wesleyan soteriology a really strong emphasis because it says in Mark sixteen that the Lord works with them and confirms the word of the gospel with signs following. So people need to be studying up on Harold Lindstrom's Wesleyan Sanctification. They need to be reading Kenneth Collins' Wesleyan on Salvation. They need to study John Wesley's Standard Sermons again, and they need to be teaching and preaching them on a regular basis. And then they need to be focusing on John Wimber and and, and, and they need to be focusing on power evangelism and power healing and prophetic ministry and Jack Deere's books. And then they need to start having ministry time and really focusing on charismatic gifts in the local church, which is the title of a book by David Pitkes. There needs to be a really, really, really strong emphasis on this now. I mean a really strong emphasis. And all of Rick Warren's books need to be thrown away. And Rick Warren needs to stop being listened to. He needs to be stopped being listened to. Rick Warren, all these guys that are like him, they need to throw those stuff, throw it all away. I don't care how much you spent on it. Throw it all away. Because all that stuff 
as is just allowing deism to exist in the church. Deism, unbelief, scientism, and people not, pastors not running after the Holy Ghost. And there's tons of people coming to these churches with this unspoken, this unspoken assumption. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Man, that's, that's scary. That is scary to think about. 